Well, there you go, folks. Um, welcome to Radio FM88 Australia, and um, we're now broadcasting simulcast live on radio and um, live through Facebook and YouTube. You can jump on to the appropriate Facebook channels and the YouTube channels. And, um, those who have been regular would understand that. If you're first time and you've been listening on the radio, now's a good time to jump on to the YouTube channel, Radio FM88 Australia, or YouTube and Dream Forest. Anyway, um, without further ado, and it's uh, obviously... Um, coming up for Easter uh, tonight after midnight. And, um, and of course, for our UK listeners, uh, they'll be switching across um, off onto Daylight Saving one. And I'll give us a heads up on that one as well. So um, all the best and um, enjoy your Easter. Andrea, it's all yours. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good day and welcome wherever you are or listening in the world to Dream in the New Dream. So thank you for being here. Um, today is the 28th of March, and yes, Easter is this coming Friday, Good Friday, so it's early this year. Anyway, without further ado, it's great pleasure to have Kath Coverson on our show today. I hope I got that right. Thank you. Um, I welcome. And Jeff met you um, last month in a Mind Body Spirit Fair, and you're all about keys to potential. So, great title because we're all doing our best to bring out the best in us and i know you were working with children and doing courses for children which obviously reflects back on the adults eh? so without further ado how did you start all this and i know you did share that you were you had a mindset to be a teacher but listening to somebody else that all changed so would you like to share your story sure it it's actually a rather a funny story because um it was lucky because I was working on my website and I needed to put together my um, all the work I'd done over the years. And it was interesting because I could look back and see these really big sliding door moments. And one of the first ones was when I was right back in high school. And when I was in school, my main goal or my dominant career goal was to be a school teacher. And there was one day, and I was in senior by this stage, and um, I ducked upstairs to do my homework because I had a teacher coming up, and um, I found her quite scary. I thought she was quite formidable. So I thought, well, I'm doing my homework. And I was up there doing the homework. I ducked out to get my bag from the bag racks, and I saw this student there from a, a lower grade and the student was standing talking to this teacher that you know I feared and telling her something along the lines of, you know, I haven't done it, I'm not going to do it, and you can't make me do it. And I, I just stood there and I thought then and there that, oh, my God, how would I handle that? I couldn't handle that. How would I deal with that situation? You know, I went back into the room. I don't know how. The teacher dealt with it, but I, to be honest, my dreams were just shattered so quickly and so easily in that one moment. So that was a really big sliding door moment. So I, I thought, you know, I was a little bit lost for a while, but ultimately I did get a job. I worked for the state government as a clerk and um, was there about eight years and in that time got married, had... Um, three kids you know not i had resigned after the second child and stayed home to be a, a stay-at-home parent and um while i was at home and the kids started growing up um i was looking for work you know i i was looking for something that didn't interfere too much with looking after the kids and it was so ironic because there's these friends of ours decided to open a clothing shop and they asked if I'd like to um, iron clothes to put into the shop. And I thought, yeah, I could do that. And then suddenly they said, well, actually, can you go into the shop and run the shop? Because we've got to go out to the wholesalers. Now, my other big handicap, you know, was I was super, super, super shy and quite nervous and not confident at all but anyway i think if they'd asked me if i wanted to work in the shop i wouldn't have accepted but because it was sort of like a side door entry i started ironing 
But over the time, you know, it was just such a brilliant opportunity for me because, you know, I grew in confidence. I could talk to people. I mean, the first month, I'm sure I didn't speak to anyone. <laughs> but um, I grew to love it, you know. Um, I, I ran the shop. You know, they'd go overseas for months and I'd be loving window displays and and so it was a that was a really sliding door moment for me because it it really brought me out and gave me the confidence now working in the clothing shop i didn't see as a career move so i decided you know i had to kids were getting older i needed to get a career so i thought i'll go to uni and I also thought, you know, this might be an opportunity to be, you know, that school teacher again. You know, I thought well, I could be a science teacher because I went back to uni to do science. Oh, well. And um, my daughter did say to me that the kids coming up today were not the same as last time. So I thought, oh, there was that niggling, you know, kids aren't easy thing. But, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to do the science and we'll see what happens. But I was doing it externally first and working full-time and then changed to going internal and working part-time. And when I was um, went internal, I'm sure the very first semester of my um, internal studies, a lecturer walked in and talked about parasites. And I was absolutely hooked I loved them. I found them fascinating. You know, I thought these manipulative little buggers, you know, they could make hosts do anything and they would um, just gnaw away sometimes at the host, you know, just um, eroding away at them. And they were so clever, so manipulative. They could, you know, the way they would do these things to avoid our immune system. And so... You know, being a science teacher sort of got swished aside because I decided I'll do honours just to see if maybe research is where I want to go. And then I also then thought, no, I'll do a PhD. But I did a PhD and I included um, parasitology and microbiology because I thought that viruses, bacteria, they're all parasites, you know. Parasites is a big field. And the main definition of a parasite is that it causes harm to its host. But, you know, I, I absolutely loved them. And when I was doing that job, um, finished that study, I ended up ultimately in a um, my last position. And this was another sliding doors moment. Because when I was working, I was the senior scientist or senior parasitologist for Biosecurities Queensland. And I thought, you know, this job's got a lot of responsibility. It, it was a lot of work. It was busy. But I loved it. It was all about parasites and everything else. COVID came in during this time and there was other influencing events. But otherwise, um, I ended up doing a course. And when I was doing the courses... I actually started using them at work. You know, if I had a difficult person to deal with, I'd think, oh, I'd know what to do. I'd, you know, go and use the strategies I'd learned in the course. Or if, if things got overwhelming or huge and busy, I would kept using the strategies um, I had already learned. And then I was there one day, you know, thinking about, you know, what difference would it have made to my life? You know, how different would it have been if I'd done the course, you know, so much earlier? You know, and I always think I certainly would have kept the science because that was something I was passionate about, but I just wondered what changes it would have made. And then I thought, um, you know, as a younger person, and I think about that time, there was just a sort of one news item after another. You know, um, a young girl had committed suicide. Uh, uh, you know, several students in the US had gone in and shot their classmates and teachers. And I mean, here there's this big scream against youth crime. You know, um, they're out of control. And the, the, the citizens, I suppose, the police are just screaming out for... Um, 
punish them, you know, punish them harder. And, and you know, it used to break my heart because I used to think, what has happened to these kids? What has happened in their lives to make them take the actions that they're taking now, you know, to get themselves in so much trouble? And, you know, it reminded me of the parasites, that the parasites I loved, you know, how clever and nasty and manipulative they are. And this is what I, I was loving about, you know, one thing you learnt in the course is that these thoughts and feelings and beliefs you have, you know, I wondered what thoughts and feelings and beliefs these kids have that made them do such, you know, as I said, take these crazy actions. It, there is a couple of parasites, you know, that um, we used to joke about when I was doing the study with the kids, and one was um, toxoplasmosis. And um, talk about manipulating its host. It would actually, if a mouse was infected with it, the mouse would actually run out in front of the cat and ensure that it was eaten by the cat because the parasite needed to complete its life cycle in the cat. Mm. And there's fish that if they're infected with the worm parasites will actually swim on the surface of water so that the bird will eat them and, again, the parasite completes its life cycle. And I thought this is like these, these kids. They've got these parasitic ideas just eroding away at them, making them do these crazy behaviours that's not them. It's not their behaviours. And so, you know, that's where I suddenly found my passion. And um, I decided that was it. I was going to change around and do this. And the irony was, I think, was when I was looking at this the other day, it's like a complete circle. You know, it was that child that was a little bit rough and out of control that was standing up and talking to the teacher and these are the kids that I actually now want to go back and work with. I mean, hopefully we work with them before they get to that stage. But they're the people that I think needs the programs. You know, they need that help. So it was funny. It would sort of went all the way around till I've ended up exactly where I wanted to be, teaching. But teaching the, the kids I, I was trying to avoid all my life. Yeah. Yeah, I never, never ha heard anyone say before how much they love parasites. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I can understand what you're saying and why. But I mean, I have to laugh because Carol put up a little comment um, just now as we were talking, and she put crumbs. Is Kath talking about politicians or parasites? <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so it's a good way, because I know you talked about emotions being your parasites and, you know, they go round and round and they f you feed on them and all of that. So so from this point, from your, that point onwards, how did you put your course together? Well, it was interesting um, because it, uh, there's been a lots and lots of changes and modifying it, and it will still modify and change to suit the um, students but it it's there's several layers to it but I've just kept it simple and the very first one is just a simple steps and processes that anybody can do and, and I've done it with adults as well and it's like a, a just a simple process they can do to stop them residing in that one space um, what we do is so the course Courses are done by the students and the, the students get the skills. I remember when um, I was a parent and I was doing things and I had three kids and I thought, you know, uh, I wasn't, things weren't effective, the kids were losing it a bit and I was struggling with my son. And I would go off and do a course how to be a good parent. And I mean, <laughs> it just added more angst to what I was doing. I was even more time poor and and, you know, but it wasn't really helping the child. I was trying to then interpret what I'd learned and put it into practice. So what I decided when I was doing these was to make the children or allow the children to do the courses so the children are the ones that get the skills. So, it, you know, it's I, I was thinking of it earlier, it's like teaching them to fish. Instead of trying to fix every time they're, they have a breakdown or, or they're in their 
a bad mood, you actually, um, instead of feeding that, we actually send them out to fish so they know how to solve the problem themselves. So they become, you know, the their own, I suppose, predominant creative person. They, they look after their own lives, so to speak. Because I know, because you said you work mainly with nine to sixteen, is that still the case? It is. I do work with adults, and when the courses uh, run, it was mainly to get kids. And I, I only really in included the sixteen in the early part because I'm really hoping that eventually it's just to the younger kids. So by the time they get to sixteen, they've actually done mm. the courses, and they're actually it's like a, a, a way of life that they have. Um, I, I could, something sort of, well, some un, unique aspects of the course is that um, so the kids do it, not the adults, although we do do a training night for the adults just so they can get the gist of what's happening and, and support it and follow along. Um, can, I just, um, can I just interrupt there? Um, yeah. What I'm picking up here, there's, there's two components to your um, whole profile here. The first one, we had a lady um, some years ago called Shakti Selwood who um, went on a, a particular diet, juice diet or whatever, and she passed out a, a six-foot-long tapeworm parasite. Oh, and, yeah. and, and we've always heard about people saying, oh, my gut instinct tells me this. And um, and then all of a sudden we've got you and you explaining how these parasites and this stuff and how they trigger the host and of course it seems like it took, that's where I come to the two processes is the first one on the health issue first of all to go through and clean the gut um, and get rid of those parasites and then the second component is coming back in and, and doing the keys to potential because they seem to dovetail between the two of them to be perfectly honest now that I'm listening to you. One would hope that if you were doing the course and you would uh, notice that there was some health issues, then you would deal with them. Actually, tapeworms, you know, they actually aren't that bad. That then, you know, I always thought tapies were all right. That don't get me started because I said to someone, "Oh, if I start talking about malaria, you know, I've really lost it." But. <laughs> 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 fascinating because they just attach to the host but they just actually hang in there and they absorb nutrients that you've eaten through the skin i mean i think that they were actually using tapeworms as a dietary thing you know a long time ago and go <laughs> put tapeworms in but you know to be honest they wouldn't help i mean if you could i used to think if i could genetically modify a tapeworm to suck up that now oh. that would be brilliant definitely <laughs> yeah so you could eat a cream bun you'd get all the nutrients and they'd just take all the fats away and you'd get this great fat tapeworm dropping off you know um all the time but, yeah, but the do. americans the americans are getting botox in their lips and in their bum <laughs> why would they get it in their bum anyway yeah so, i'm not sure <laughs> don't think we'll go uh, there <laughs> no i don't think all right, but, so I'll change the subject there, but I just felt when I was listening to you, I realised, oh, my God, um, there is a health issue here and, and you, you seem to dovetail between the two of them because of your background in, in microbiology and the parasit, parasites. It just but, seems like and educating on top of that again. It's, it's a, I think you've got a really great, um, oh, it's a, a surreal product overall. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. Actually, that's what I was going to say. That the the courses are actually just based on fun activities and games. So really, the the kids don't even know that they're really learning. And actually, when I've run it with adults, you know, they just think it's fun as well. I do exactly the same thing I do with the kids that I do with the adults. Um, the other thing is. Yeah, it's simple. The course recognizes it helps them to actually recognize their emotions and to understand that emotions are just information. That's all they are. They're just information of what's happening for you. 
they're actually specific to you. And that's important for them to know too that um, their emotions are actually just their emotions. And the other thing to um, realise is that um, being angry or sad or anxious is not bad. It's not good. It's not wrong. It's not right. It is just information of, of what's going on for them. It's their reaction to a situation or event. But what we try to do is to separate um, that emotion. A lot of people, young and old, get caught in the emotion of an event. You know, they're angry. And you know when they're angry, you just can't get through to them. You know, mm. that they won't listen. They shut, they're shut down. And all their actions come from, from this angry space. So we play games to separate anger out a little bit so they get to understand. So, okay, you're feeling that emotion, but what are you thinking? And, you know, there's other things that they have to recognise that's going on. So the emotion doesn't get to um, to be the, the main player of information for them to stay in and react in. And they, they get to learn too that their emotions are definitely unique to them. So a situation may happen. And there's one we do in the first class. It's um, there's three girls, you know, and there is a small stray dog. And the, the girls, same age, same size, you know, and they see this dog. Now, you know, one little girl's going to think, oh, you know, or she could think that she's really scared that the dog will bite her. And another one will think that dog is disgusting. You know, it's got stuff stuck all over it and it smells and it's just awful. You know, it's just disease on a stick. That would be me. And the third one will just push past the other two and rush down and pick up the sad-looking puppy. That would be my daughter and she'd bring it home and hope she could keep it. And <laughs> But, you know, very different reactions. So everybody understands that their emotions are just their emotions and it's really there is information, you know, nothing else. Um, so, the other thing, oh, sorry, that was just say is that go we learn they're not broken. It's okay to be angry. It is okay to be anxious. You know, um, each person is unique. That's who they are, and um, we're not going to fix them or change them. And the world needs unique people. You know, all the things that shape us make us unique. And so we don't change who they are. We just get them to spend less time as the angry person or the anxious person. Fantastic. So when you're working with the younger children, how much do they blame it on their parents' different things when you're working we don't even get to that stage. What we do is um, they play games and the first one's just imagination games and it's just a practice to separate thoughts, feelings and other information. So we just play games. And it's not about blaming um, anybody else because all they're worried about is themselves and what they're going through. So we play the um those games and those games are really important too because the kids have to learn to share um so they're there and they they get comfortable sharing they get comfortable um you know talking about what they're thinking what they're feeling and what they're seeing and they get comfortable with the process so they um we play the games and then we just get to the stage of uh thinking about okay, what's, you know, a situation that went, um, that didn't work out? And, you know, one little girl had to, that a friend came up and wouldn't, just, just said to her, I don't want to play with you today. <laughs> you know, that could be quite crushing. But mm. so, you know, we you stand there and we use circles and I love circles because circles define a space. They keep it in that space. So when you're in that space and you're working through what you're thinking, what you're feeling, it's just there. You don't go away with it. You don't take it away. It remains in that circle. And sometimes we rub the circle out if we're working on paper. Sometimes we put a line through it. 
but they stay in that circle until they've looked at all the aspects. But then we um, we have to tell them to, okay, but what would you really love? You know, even though this girl has said she doesn't want to play with you. And what it does is it just changed their whole focus. So then they focus on, well, you know, I might just want to go to the library and be with some friends and do some stuff or I want to do this or I want to do that. And so they go to a second circle and they think about what they'd really like to choose. And later on, they actually then take an action from the second circle to create what they've just decided what they'd like to do. You know, they might go and get the bag and go to the library. And, you know, what you've done is you've shifted them out of this heartbreak, you know, into some thinking about what they can do and that's their new focus and off they go. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all little rules. You can't make choices from the first circle because that just keeps you in that nasty parasite-filled fest. You can only make them from the second circle. How many, how many do you have in your group sessions at a time? Yeah. They've only been, there's only been a few and there's only been a few at a time, but you only want, to be honest, about 10 because you want everybody to um, to be seen and yeah. to be heard and to, to share. You know, you don't want those ones that sit there and slide away in the background because, you know, there's one person that shares a lot. or So you keep the group small. Also, too, if someone might be a bit uncomfortable about sharing, you know, they get quite comfortable in the smaller group. You know, it's it's more yeah. a, a little group that we're meeting with. How long do they do your your group sessions run for each one? Like so, like you've got like key one. So is that like a five week program, and then they can go on to key two? How does that work? Yeah, key one runs for four weeks. And again, this one, this has been structured because I, I'm very parent focused or, as well. And it, so what they do is they pay for four classes or four sessions. Now, the first session is the intro. We actually go through the majority of the, the work in that one week. I, when I first started, you know, I went and I ran it with a couple of people and we, we ran it and they loved it and they had fun and everything else and they went home and, and just forgot about it, you know, and I went back a couple of weeks later to reinforce it and they thought it was just a fun thing they did that day. Mm -hmm. So we structured it. So once a week uh, on a Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the month, there is the intro class. So everyone has to do the intro class, but then they can drop in to three Saturday classes they don't have to be in order. They don't have to be, you know, if a person's away for two weeks, doesn't matter. They can just still drop in any three Saturday classes. And what these do, they reinforce the process. So they can go away for a week or two weeks and and think about what they do, you know, and you come back and you'd say, well, um, was there any problems? You know, was there a situation? You know, can anyone, oh, yeah, you know, I was really angry and I that then I remembered and I did my so, you know, and you want to reinforce that this is the way you do it. The other thing is when you first start these processes, it does take a little bit of time, you know, because you, you're kind of manually working your way through. But I mean, for myself, uh, it's very quick. As soon as I notice that I'm feeling a negative, you know, angry or more frustrated, I think, well, hang on, something's going on here. But for kids, um, hopefully it becomes a quicker, faster process over time once they've done it a few times. And that's why it runs for at least four weeks. They can stay longer because they, you know, it's just reinforcing the habit and that's what it's, so it becomes a, a natural process. And, you know, the younger the kids are, the easier it is to introduce a new habit. It's much harder in a, um, a more mature person. I know my sister-in-law, and she'll be telling me something. And I said, even my daughter, I said, oh, did you think about, you know, the circle? She goes, no, nah, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't think about the circle because we're so patterned to do act and react how we have. Hmm. 
How do so, people find you? Oh, stop going. No, I was going to say that was um, how I. So it's sort of family friendly. So it's online. So they can be at home and they just drop in. And it's, so no one has to be taken anywhere or picked up. And um, they can use the classes up as it suits them. Yeah, online. Actually, this was a great opportunity doing this. And I have to thank you both <laughs> to um, being on the radio show. Uh, but they, it's online, I guess, uh, you know, that was something that I've actually been working on as well, is about getting the programs out there. And that was why I did Mind, Body and Spirit Festival, was to just, you know, get the courses out to the people that um, need them. Did you find a lot of people were talking to you about what you're doing and, and asking lots of questions? They did, actually. And it was quite a, a learning um, curve. Of because course. it was interesting because there was, I had posters up and I could see that some people were a little confronted by the posters and didn't want to admit that there was a problem. Then I, uh, there was also the people where they thought, oh, yeah, this would be great. You know, I'm going to, you know, little Billy here is, you know, always causing me trouble. It would be great. But then little Billy saw, um, you know, recognising and processing emotions and just it didn't really tick little Billy's, you know, interest at all and there was no way he would you know wants to go along to a course once a week four weeks yeah you know, to recognize his emotions i mean please yeah. <laughs> uh, it was funny we just went through i was talking to a mentor the other day and we just went through and decided well the adults get the information recognizing and processing emotions but the kids so we put nonsensical names in there so Instead of key one was recognising and processing emotions, it's now called shizzle. So a kid, you know, could be probably quite happy to say he or she has to go to shizzle on Saturday and if yeah. anyone's what's shizzle, they'd say, oh, we just play games, we have fun, you know, and there's no um, repercussions to it. There's no agendas or judgments. It's just this nonsensical thing, a fun thing that they do. Fabulous. Um, yes, yeah, so, like, obviously, you that was your first time at the Mind, Body, Spirit Fair. So, so how are people going to find you apart from that? Well, so first off, I will be posting. There is also, I was considering other podcasts. Right. But otherwise... That is, oh, I've written a book as well. Oh, have you? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that I've written a book and it's it's actually aimed at 15-year-olds um, and it's a boy. It was a crazy thing to do, I thought. But it's a book about Josh and, to be honest, it is just program one, maybe little bits of other programs woven into stories. Nice. So it's a story showing um you know about self-awareness and making choices so that's for actually probably 12 to 15 16 year old boys but um i've had a lot of adults read that one and love it as well oh, that's good. so there's the book and i had intended of taking the book when it's published it's at the publishers now when it's published i was uh going to take the book to schools to see if they wanted to include it in their um, library. So the book was also a bit of an avenue for getting um, the programs out there. But that that is my current um, work, is trying to get the programs to the people. Mm. So what about if you <clears throat> obviously introduce yourself to schools and you know, went to different schools to, but then I suppose you've got to get the, have you got, is it better to get the parents more interested 
than the children or something when you're talking sort of the children think oh i wouldn't mind trying that I, that was interesting I, I know if i do and i probably will do a mind body and spirit festival again i was telling the people about the course and um the a lot of adults said well i would be interested in doing that and um so next year i'll definitely have brochures that say you know this is for the adults mm -hmm. and this is for the um children um for, i i love doing it with adults because you know it doesn't go very deep it's not going into i mean the second one does go a little bit deeper of course too because you actually look at why your response is anger whereas someone else might feel anxiety why you feel sad and depressed whereas someone else has got a completely different reaction so um I can't remember where I was going. I got distracted with my own picture. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do love doing it with adults because it's just an easy, uh, you know, I used to tell them at the, at the festival, it's just a hack for adults. It's such a quick, easy thing to recognise suddenly you're in a bad mood, you don't have to be. Mm. So they can, you can just use it. It's just a simple thing of, of stopping and, and recognising it and moving on and that's all this one does it's not going to go too deep and um, resolve issues that have been there since you're a child this courses i did uh, um, are brilliant i'd probably recommend that they you know do those up if they want to go deeper into it and look at you know why they think and feel the way they do we can certainly touch on it and I would certainly, if someone's interested in coaching someone through it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, what was I going to ask you then? Oh, so it must give you great satisfaction, like when a child comes through the, the first session and they're working through. Because in the past, we've all been taught to block our emotions and sh push them away and not deal with them. Whereas now everything's shifted so much energy is different that you you know you have to look at what's going on and, and work through it and move it on don't you yeah and you know sometimes just recognizing that you're angry it feels like okay she's recognized me i can see that i'm angry it really seems to take some of the sting mm -hmm. out of it, some of the but we don't try and dismiss it or replace it or substitute it or you know let's think of happy thoughts or any of those sorts of things we just say okay you're angry and um i mean in the courses we did learn that anger is actually powerlessness so if someone's feeling quite angry i know that they're coming from a, a position where they're feeling like something's happening to them they're not the ones in control mm. so um you can address that but we won't ever change that. But it's just recognizing that, you know, I, I angry people are all right. They're, they're probably just quite passionate. <laughs> we just want to move that passion to the wrong, to the right left, to the right <clears throat> direction. But we never want to change it. We don't, we don't ever want to change the person. You know, I said before that they're not broken. They don't need to be fixed. They just need to be able to um, cope. And, I mean, to be honest, these these um, programs are so helpful if, for the adults. I mean, at, sometimes when kids get caught in this anger or they get depressed and they withdraw, you know, the parents just can't communicate with them. Mm. And they're not doing well at home. You know, they're causing discomfort at home. The parents themselves feel like, you know, they're failures, that they have somehow not managed to do the right thing or, or you know, there's a bit of a shame they don't want to tell people. I could see people not wanting to admit that there was a problem. Um, and at school, you know, they're not learning because they're just shut down. I mean, trying to talk to a kid when they're angry is is just near impossible. 
So after, you know, they've done the courses, then they get to be a little bit more calmer at school. So the outcome reflects back into the family. So the family is a, a certainly a more dynamic, happier environment. And at school, you, instead of being the problem child, you know, suddenly they're, they're open, they're learning and they're enjoying school. Mm. Do you find like when they do like step one, they've quite enjoyed it and then they want to go on to step two. So you're watching their progress of, you know, they're sort of becoming more into their power and re letting go of lots of things that have been bothering them. Well, I wouldn't. Originally, I, I used to have that the young ones, you know, the nine, tens, elevens. They would just stay in the first course. But the difference is you can get some nine-year-olds that, you know, as more mature than some 15-year-olds. So I changed that. But to be honest, a lot of the time, I think a lot of them are quite comfortable in the first one because they suddenly feel that life isn't so bad. For the older kids, you know, I sort of encourage it a little bit. Um it's to, and I think it's more that it's something if they choose to want to know more. You know, everybody learns much better when they're the ones that have chosen to, to do the course or to do the work. So if they've been in the first one for a while and, um, and feel that, yeah, you know, they're really comfortable and they got that, and they may start to wonder why, you know, they get the angry one, yet, you know, Johnny in the class is always anxious. You know, he's worried about this and he's worried about that. And um, when their curiosity is peaked, then there's definitely the movement to the second class. The other three or four, well, there's three really, structure, um, focus and resistance, they're really there as tools for the students to learn to be more, I suppose, more academic success as well as emotional success. It teaches them about um, being focused on what they want to get and what they want to create. And the process we use in the very first one really just flows through all of them. So you need to do the first one before any of the others. But, again, we still play games, you know, for the focus one. You know, we play a game. And that's for the people that were with me, you know, where you've got to throw a ball through a, a small hoop. And, you know, you ask them, so what were you thinking about? You know, and some of them didn't want to do it because they thought they would miss and look a fool. And it, that lets them know that's where their focus is, not on what they want to create, that they're getting distracted by how something should be, you know, what they could do or what do they need or do they have enough time? You know, there's lots of distractions that take them away from their focus. So these are just simple um, tools they learn to get their focus back on. That You know, that will help them as well, you know, a great deal academically. The same as structure, you know. Structure to me is almost like habits. You know, when you want to change something, you need to change the structure. The structure is, can make things so simple. I remember when my one of my daughters wanted to give up smoking, you know, and she'd get up in the morning and out in the patio, cigarette, cup of coffee. But the easiest, one of the easiest ways to reinforce this is to change that structure. You don't get up and have that cigarette and cup of coffee. You might have your first cup of coffee, you know, in your room before, while you're sorting out what you're going to wear. You, you just change the structure. So they learn about having structures, you know, about setting up structures. Like they get home, they might decide to do their homework first and then they've got mm. the free time. It's setting up structures for success. And it's the same as resistance. Resistance is another one where um, resistance is funny because it can be a little bit sneaky. You know, you, you think you're doing stuff, but towards the end result, but little things get in the way, you know, you don't have time, you've got other things you need to do that's much more important. 
But this is just resistance, believe it or not, to doing what you should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's these are just and they're just little two days and. Um, that's just really a, a growth thing. So the first two, and because the courses are for children, they just kept it this simple layer just to give them some information and a guide. Mm. No, it sounds fantastic because obviously you're giving them a great start to, you know, look at their emotions and, you know, it, and like it is recognising straight away something, you know, we get a trigger and I think, Oh, and then I think, right, okay, why, you know, look, it's looking at it and then it, it's like either giving it a voice or recognising it, all right, okay, there's some still some anger there and, and move on sort of thing. So do you find now that you're going to be doing more for the adults as well? Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, um, again, you know, I, I think adults are funny to work with <laughs> because they're not as... Um, open and, as, and accepting mm. as kids. You know, kids don't see that there is um, anything wrong with what they think and feel and they're quite happy to say, oh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do something different. But adults can get quite um, rigid. A lot of adults like to think that and that it's somebody else's fault. It's not them. It's... It's the others that have caused this. And look, that is a, I don't know if it's a good thing to say, but that's a bad way to think. You know, if you think that something bad's happened to you because of somebody else, that takes away all your power. What you've just said is, I am so powerless that these things happen to me because of this other person. Whereas if you can stand up and say, okay, I created this ship fest. If I created it and accept that I created it, then I can create something different. So a lot of people, it's difficult to shift them from the blaming others. It's not their fault. They ran out of time. Their car broke down. You know, all of these things. If they learn to accept that, that they actually created that, that is quite an empowering way to be. And I think that's quite a key word at the moment is having acceptance. You know, you, you can't, you know, whilst the past is gone, you can't change it. The future yeah. hasn't happened. We are here now in this moment. And whatever's going on, you know, different challenges or whatever, it's just having acceptance. This is what's happening now, isn't it? It is. And, you know, there is actually a course that, and actually I'm going to Africa to do part of this sort of course, and that's the thing, the past is over. Mm. When you're living in your emotions, you're actually living in your past because emotions trap you into um, what happened in your past. And that's one of the important things we do for the kids. We ask them, what do you see? What, what do you see happening? And... That is, believe it, such a simple statement that's so pivotal because what you're doing is you're bringing them back to the present. Mm. What is actually happening now? And I, I do that with adults. So what do you see? Because, you know, otherwise they get into this anger thing or whatever it is and they're going, oh, you know, it always happens to me. You know, they, they all, I'm always being told what to do. There's always someone that's, you know, telling me, and you know, I, I'm the one that's got to do they're, they're way back in things that happened, you know, last week, last year, five years ago. So if you sort of say to them, but what do you see? And um, they think, well, oh, you know, things come up to me. And so we want to bring them into the present to actually react to what's actually happening at this point in time. Fantastic. Hey, um, um, just to answer. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Hey, um, I've got a mate of mine and his missus, and um, they make sure that they go out on a date night on a Thursday. Yeah, so they've been married, you know, before, so they've got both got adult children, but they've come to the understanding that they need to have time for themselves. They have a busy life, and they set aside a date night. Um, while I was listening to you, and I'm um, 
seeing all these different relationships that have um, come together than they've dropped away and um, throughout life it seems to be your, your um, keys of potential could be um, a date night for uh, couples to come and um, explore the emotions of their relationship and how the power of words has affected a fella um, because the woman's pr mind's processing things and expressing it and the fella saying oh, where did that come from and then so your um your fun that you're talking about um would would probably bring some life and some um festive and some, some joy back to um a, um a, a relationship a marriage de facto whatever you want to call it uh, yeah i'm feeling that pretty strong with you yeah actually you know you are so right you know even the kids have to learn that you do not know and that was that's all through the book you do not know what other people are thinking we are always going around thinking what we think other people are thinking so you know in in couples it's it's interesting because they um they think that this is what the other person is thinking and but they have no real idea and when you break it down and, and you're right it would be a, actually a fun thing you know they'd go they'd say okay this was an event and then to find out that the person was was thinking this and feeling this and seeing this you know it's it's quite an eye opener the other thing is too you want to take away the responsibility of the other person trying to keep this person happy you're only responsible for yourself you know everybody well, we would say is a sovereign being. So everybody has the the ability, you know, they're a strong, capable human being. You know, we're not there to make sure that that person is happy. You, you want to be yourself. And if yourself, who you are, the way you are, and the way you express yourself and the things you do does not automatically fit in with that person, then it, it isn't a good fit. But you don't act or try and be what you think someone else wants because you're just guessing. You have no idea what another person is thinking. Hey, uh, I know a lot of um, potential healers, you know, body workers, if you want to call it such, or cranial, sacral, or uh, remedial massage and so forth, and they're working on people's bodies. And um, energetically, they're actually picking up the energy of that individual who's come to see them um not only do they take on that etheric body of the person who they've just treated i noticed that one of those um healers she will always go and have a shower after the client to have those negative ions go through the body just to cleanse her ready for the next client because she's discovered that when she when she um goes to bed with her her husband she can bring all the energetic energy from all the clients that she's treated back into their family bed and it, it does create um she's learned that it did create a lot of issues in their marriage and now what she's gone and done is transformed that and um they've got a very healthy relationship i'm just saying yeah no but, and that's another thing it's funny when you're doing this work it actually feels quite energized because there is something well, i suppose it you're a bit passionate about it and there's energy to it and there is this element of fun with people having fun there is no um no negative sort of thing I, and that was another thing i don't know if i mentioned it before when the kids are feeling angry or whatever that their emotion they go to one is they'll have a big one and then they have they'll feel the the, the array of emotions but we tend to have a, a really big dominant one, you know. And but what we let them know too, it's really important that there is there is no nothing right or wrong about these feelings, and there's nothing good or bad about these feelings. You know, if you're an angry person, that's who you are. So that that's absolutely fine. Actually, I, you know, if after this talk, if married couples want to book in, very happy. Oh, you mentioned Africa. So what are you doing going to Africa then? 
Well, the guy that does all the, the courses I did, which was William Whitecloud, he's running a retreat in Africa. And um, a friend and I are going to go together, Camille, so that will be quite interesting. And I believe, so at the retreat, that is the, the theme or the premise for the the um, the holiday I suppose I could call it a holiday I tell everyone I'm going on a holiday to Africa but you know it's to me South Africa and that that's the cradle of civilization so I was keen to go there because of the you know out of Africa yes and it's quite I think of quite a you know I'm have looking, you been before no I'm looking at some good energy from there yeah well, that'd be amazing how long are you going for well actually I, I staying on for a second retreat with another person so i'll be there about a month wow wow when you go in uh second of august i fly out and return on about the 28th or 29th wow well have a fantastic time i know you will so uh, yeah yeah it'll be good yeah. hey um i just want to make a, an observation of 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 life itself I mean, I'm talking about my age group, our age group, and um, <laughs> that we didn't have the intrusion of uh, government um, or councils. Everything had to be done um, as a community. You built your tribe. I mean, um, if you want to build the clubhouse, you know, the men turned up and dug the trenches and then they used their networks to get building materials at, you know, trade price and, and the, the girls would turn up and have all the sandwiches and they bring in their teas and all that stuff. And, and we built tribes. And we also did, you know, Cubs and Scouts was all about collecting um, bottles and bottle drives to raise funds to, for, for, to well, we Sea Scouts, so to buy boats and also for the, um, the Dead Scout then and then go for camping and so forth. And um, for the surf club, you know, every weekend we turned up and, and, and that, uh, bonding with all the boys you know we've got fellows now who are passing away and and all the boys turn up to the funerals and but apart from that we twice a year we get together for barefoot bowls and a couple of boys go and play golf my rugby league guys we don't have that the, the, the club died once the brisbane broncos came into the football league so um w what i saw was that <clears throat> now with the COVID situation for three and a half years we lost um our tribe and we had to find a new tribe and we found that tribe online and they could be anywhere in the world but it still missed out on the actual hugs and the actual sitting down mm -hmm. and enjoying. um you know you girls might have a rosé or it might be a, a cup of tea or, or um, just that one-on-one -on -one human interaction and contact and and i think what i've observed is that when we grew up we would always catch up with our cousins and our cousins would, would all come together and we're very strong and thick and that's because um you know in queensland here you had to go to your local um, newspaper to find out when the service stations would be open after 12 o'clock on a saturday and who'd be open on a sunday because they would all close down on a saturday and so to the saturday shopping would close at at 12 o'clock on a saturday and you would had late night on a friday night and late night on a thursday night in the suburbs but it meant that from 12 o'clock on Saturday afternoon and through to Sunday, it was time for family and friends to gather. And we don't have that now because of the, the whole dynamics of retail where you know, the, um, kids are not interacting with their their, their parents or their, their cousins because no one's got the time to actually interact and, and play um, cricket down at the park or kick the ball around or <laughs> go for a paddle in the pool or whatever. Uh, and I find our tribe has somewhat been uh just dis disorganized disjointed um it's kind of disarray and trying to find that that tribe is where um your key is the potential for these kids to find um who is my tribe who, who can i relate to you know so you know you might have gone to school and you might learn to play tennis or you might have you know played football or you, you know um might be in the reading class and learning about drama and all that stuff. I mean, I grew up in, a, in an environment that if you went dancing or you were singing, um, you were you were batting for the other team. And so generally all us males never went down that path, you know. And so um, 
if it seems to me that our society and one strength was coming together and now it's um, disintegrated in, this, in the other sense that people moved into, well, I'm, I'm using Queensland now as an example, of a major attraction. It was like must come into the light. So people come from all over the world and all over um, Australia to come into Queensland and there was no networks because the parents came and they never had gone to school or have been in the services, in the clubs or associates. So it became very strained. Um, so I'm just seeing as a, as a whole tribal community, we seem to be disjointed and we're not actually interacting with our people anymore. We're not building our clubs. We're handing that responsibility to the, to the government or to the council to build. We're not, we seem to be, we're not really being humans, interacting with humans anymore. No. We're quite fragmented, actually. So we've separated out. Actually, that was to reminded me of two things. One is, yeah, in the groups, you can get quite this um, feeling of, you know, a, a belonging, you know. And the thing is, there is no, because the gangs are so imaginative, there is nothing, you wouldn't label anything. There is no way of labeling it because they're just creative. So one wouldn't think that it was a girl's thing or a boy's thing because the whole time they're actually, it's an imagination thing. It's a, a thing, you know, their, their activities and their games and their, they're just fun things to do. So they're not, um, I was going to say, they're not female or male orientated. It's quite an easy thing. The other thing, you know, uh, I also, uh, when I first started out, I, I was trying to put together these two, I, I called them rites of passage, because I really think, you know, kids somewhere miss, you know, that there is a certain series of events that they get to experience to let them know that they're, they're getting a little older, you know, than that they're they're getting more mature. You know, these days they're just hustled along and thrown out to a dance where they all dress up. And um, I wanted to run, so it's called Rites of Passage, one for girls and one for boys, where they'd go away for, you know, three days, two nights, and it's just full of activities where they're, they're unplugged and they're um, almost plugged into the environment. You know, the boys get to do orienteering and... The, uh, and uh, talk from a, an elder and the girls get to hear stories and do yoga and and to do all, you know, drumming and there was a whole pile of activities to give them this, this rites of passage. So when they finished primary school and before they hit high school, it was something they could go through to sort of reflect some sort of growth in themselves, a recognition of moving on. Um, but that was still in the planning stage. <laughs> well, that's so needed everywhere these days, isn't it? Bringing mm. people back together, especially on the evening, sitting around a campfire. Yes, yes. You know, just people just sat talking and, you know, being under the stars. Well, if you're in the right country and you can see them. <laughs> yeah. But and we that, haven't been seeing them, I have to tell you. Well, no, that's <laughs> true, yeah. So, We've had yeah. plenty of rain. Hmm. Okay. So is there anything that you'd like to, um, words of wisdom that you'd like to leave us with before we finish today? Um, just to go online and book in. No, don't think about it. Book in. You can book in. And as I said, that it's all structured around to make it comfortable and easy. Um, the relief you get when you're you know, you're doing something for the kids to help themselves. It's not about um, making them happy. It's making them wise. You're actually helping them to be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and if you want to do the courses as well, all adults, anybody happy to do the course? That's absolutely fine. You just let me know the age when you're booking in and we can do groups of adults. And uh, it's true. They they really are fun. And I fun is like fun. Um, Jack Nicholson <laughs> and one flew of the cookie nest or what? <laughs> no, not that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, 
that's so needed in schools nowadays um you know ev everywhere you go you know if you could give people or children that start from a young age you know what a difference it would make to all the children around the world mm. yeah I, I actually approached the schools trying to get it in because i thought that just the key one program in mm. schools would be good you know but uh you know the schools uh, i guess they've got people approaching them all the time but the school said that they've got a program and when i looked at the program it was about the teachers <laughs> recognizing the students that needed their individual attention and this the teachers recognizing and doing stuff and i thought no well you know what about giving the kids yeah tools to do stuff mm. but it is a dream of mine to see actually that key one program uh put in schools fantastic that would be mm. so good i think mm. okay well thank you so so much and i wish you all the luck and success in the world because it sounds amazing so Carol's written, how can people best eliminate parasites from their systems? What natural remedies would be helpful? And I know that I was told diatomaceous earth is brilliant for a um, spoonful of that for getting rid of any unwanted hangers on. Oh. So. Yeah, I, I, it depends. I mean, you know, some parasites aren't too bad. <laughs> Not the tapies, of course, because they're useless. But there are some people that, um, and I don't know if it's the hookworm, whatever worm they're using to, to reduce inflammation in certain parts of the digestive system. I think it's Crohn's disease. They're actually looking at a, a parasite as a possible, you know, not that I'd mess with biology. No, no. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> God, mind boggles. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. Right. Well, thank, you. thank you both. No, thank you. It's been it's been lovely listening to you and sharing, and it's so so needed. So, is that the power is to be for it to go out on this powerful time out the airwaves to where it needs to go? Okay. Thank you. So, thank you everybody for listening. And I'm having a holiday next week. I'm having some time out. So, um, but Jeff is going to be doing something on a Sunday evening, which I might tune into. We'll take it from there. Hey, um, I'm going to, um, because the lady's in the United States and it's too early in the morning for us, so we're going to do the show, but we're not going to, we're going to record it and then play it on our normal Thursday night. But um, look, this lady we're going to have, she's from um, a former, from the Department of Defence, and um, she's going to um, explain about time for disclosure with all the um, extraterrestrials, um, people off world who have um, you know, met up with different governments over the years here on the planet earth and um it's going to be an interesting subject mm, very yeah, yeah. all right okay. all right well thank you once again kath and thank you jeffrey and um thank you everybody for listening yeah okay. bye